After Freud, Adler, and Jung, there are many who supported and adjusted psychoanalytic thought. These neo-Freudians both expanded and undermined Freud's views. Anna Freud was the youngest of Sigmund's six children, and the only one to show an interest in his work. She began reading his books when she was 15, and wanted to become an analyst in her early 20s. But who could you go to when there's no one better than your dad? So when she was 23 and Sigmund was in his early 60s, she entered psychoanalysis with her father. Sounds Freudian, doesn't it? After Sigmund's death, Anna was the defender of the faith. She continued to promote his ideas, but tended to emphasize ego more than her father had. Anna focused her work on children. She maintained that playtime was normal, and showed children's ability to adapt to reality. Children aren't simply bundles of unconscious conflicts. They are adaptive and creative beings. Anna showed that children looked to their parents for cues on how to react to situations. During World War II bombing raids, British families were observed in raid shelters. The children didn't have instinctive reactions, but looked to the adults to see how to react. If the adults were fearful, the children were fearful. If the adults were calm, so were the kids. Anna Freud created a classification system to organize evaluations of children's symptoms. Development was seen as a series of id-ego interactions, where children gained increased control of themselves. Eric Erickson was analyzed by Anna Freud. He emphasized the impact of society on the ego, the continuity of the present with the past, and the importance of personal identity, an inner sense of uniqueness. Erickson saw ego as a creative problem solver. It helps organize one's personality and synthesizes the conscious and unconscious experiences. It works to optimize performance as well as avoid anxiety. Erickson proposed eight stages of development. The first five stages were comparable to Freud's. Freud's were oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. Erickson's were infancy, muscular, locomotor, latency, and adolescence. Erickson added three extra stages. In his sixth stage, you struggle with intimacy and developing love. In the seventh stage, which extends from the mid-twenties to sixty-five, people focus on being productive by having children and careers. Maturity is the eighth stage and includes the development of wisdom and a struggle to turn the fear of death into an integrated self. In his later years, Erickson studied two Native American tribes, the Sioux of South Dakota and the Uruk Salmon Fishermen of Northern California. He found the Sioux to be trusting and generous, while the Uruk were miserable and suspicious. According to Erickson, the difference in behavior was the result of their cultures. Karen Horney didn't study directly with Freud, but was greatly influenced by his work. A medical doctor by training, her writings aren't a systematic theory of psychology, but they do show how Freud's concepts were modified and expanded by his followers. Karen's concept of basic anxiety embraces Freudian thought, but extends its interpretive usefulness. For Horney, basic anxiety is feeling helpless and a product of culturalization. It produces a drive for safety and security. Horney may be best known for pointing out that people live under the tyranny of should. The more neurotic we are, the more likely we are to live by the rules of others and not make our own decisions. If there was a Dr. Karen radio show, someone would probably call in and say, I should go home for Thanksgiving. I don't like my family, they're mean-spirited and trying to get me hooked on drugs again, but I feel like I ought to go. What do you think, Dr. Karen? I'd yell at the caller. Dr. Horney would probably point out how strongly we strive for affection, approval, and perfection. Eric Fromm received his Ph.D. from the University of Heidelberg in 1922. His loosely constructed theory of personality combined Freud and Karl Marx. Fromm argued that people are lonely. To counteract loneliness, people use myths, religion, and totalitarianism to bind themselves to each other. But this conformity to society would not solve the problem. The only real solution is to join with others in a spirit of love. Fromm proposed five basic needs. Relatedness, creating relationships. Transcendence, rootedness, putting down roots. Identity, uniqueness. And orientation, a consistent frame of reference. Melanie Klein was one of the founders of object relations theory. Although she believed aggression is an important and common factor in childhood, Klein modified Freud's drive theory. She maintained that drives are psychological forces, not biological. These forces seek people as their objects. That is, we are driven to interact with people, 
and to use those interactions to fulfill our needs. According to this view, children construct an internal representation of people. These representations are rough estimates of reality. A young child doesn't have the capacity to understand complex relationships, so they create simple images of the people in their world. Then they apply these rules to real people. She's like mom, he's like Uncle Fred. This approach works well when you're young, but these early stereotypes make it hard to relate to people as they actually are. Because of these images, children are slow to develop realistic relationships with the world. They find it difficult to give up their unconscious fantasies. They prefer the fantasy that mom is always good and the dad is a superhero. The truth is more difficult to accept. It's harder to understand that mom is both good and mean sometimes, or that dad can be dependable and strong and yet not able to jump over tall buildings in a single bound. Klein also believed that in order to avoid the anxiety over mixed feelings or aggressive impulses, children learn to separate their emotions from the target person or object. Objects tend to be good and feelings bad. This connect or splitting causes problems in later life. Klein was the first to use play therapy. She had children play with toys and used these sessions to get a better understanding of their drives and emotions. Klein was part of an ongoing battle of words that threatened to destroy the British Psychoanalytic Society. Some of the conflict was over how to interpret a child's ego defenses, but much of the drama was not about the use of fantasy projection and regression. It was a battle of personalities. It was a battle of the giants. Melanie Klein versus Anna Freud. In this corner was Melanie Klein, the first to apply psychoanalysis to children, beating out Anna Freud by four years. Klein was a radical, daring to change the ideas of Sigmund Freud. And in this quarter, there was Anna Freud, youngest daughter of Sigmund Freud, an heir to the Freud legacy, upholder of classical psychoanalysis. Joining Anna Freud's group was Melita Schmigberg, Melanie Klein's daughter, with whom she never reconciled. Each camp offered a training program and held that their approach alone should be the official training program of the organization. More than that, they wanted the other one expelled from the society. The winner? Actually, the winner was the third group, the independents, whose primary concern was compromise. In the end, the society did what all organizations do. They solved the issue politically. Each side was asked to make formal presentations of their theories. A panel listened to all concerned and decided the society would offer both training programs, a simple solution that only took five years to reach.